So if you want to draw the image formed by the plane mirror, always do this method. Measure the distance between the object and the mirror and same distance you will make and locate the position of image. And from the position of image, you will draw two light rays where the rays from the image combine with the rays from the object. So this is a simple technique to draw an image formed by a plane mirror. And this image, image formed by a plane mirror or image formed by a convex lens as a magnifying glass, what is common? They are virtual images, it means we cannot see or take them on the screen. Figure 7.2 shows uh, drawn to scale, like everything is with measurement. It shows an object of uh, PQ and a convex lens. And you can see the object is between the focus and the lens. So when, without drawing this, you can identify that this image should be a virtual image, means this should cannot be taken on screen. So first we draw the parallel light ray from the object. It will pass through the focus. One through the center of the lens will pass straight. So the two light rays will never meet. So when we look from the other side, when our brain sends the position, so it creates these two light rays backward. This is our imagination. So it produces them backward as a result. When it produces these two light rays backward, the point where the two light rays will intersect or meet, that will be the position of the image. And what are the characteristic or the properties of this image? So this, we represent the image by letter I. So what are the characteristic of this image? This will be virtual, means cannot be taken on screen. This is upright. Like if the image head is up, the object head is also up. So both are upright and they are on the same side as well as magnified. The size of image is larger than the size of object. So in a space below, draw a diagram which represent a sound waves. So what are sound waves? Sound waves are longitudinal. Longitudinal wave means the particle vibrate parallel. So, and it is having a two regions. One is compression, another one is a rarefaction. Compression, the particles are very close to each other. The pressure is high and the rarefaction means where the particles are away from each other and the pressure is low. So compression, compression, rarefaction, rarefaction and compression. Some student view this way. That is wrong because sound waves are not transverse. Sound waves are longitudinal. We have, and we have to label the wavelength. So wavelength is actually a distance between the two successive compressions or the two successive rarefactions. Figure 7.1. Figure 7.1 is an electromagnetic spectrum on a figure label the position of a gamma visible and radio. So before X-rays, we have gamma rays. Between X-ray and infrared, we have visible. And after infrared, we have radio. We just have to label only these three as they ask. Then state which of the three type of wave has the lowest frequency lowest frequency or longer wavelength. So which of them, gamma, visible or radio? So radio, because in this order, when we move, radio is having the shortest uh, frequency or lowest frequency and the longest wavelength. And state the approximate speed in air. All these electromagnetic radiation, they all travel with the same speed. That is three into 10 to the power eight meter per second. So this is the approximate speed of these all waves in air or in vacuum. Now this question, 
which is alternative to practical. The student is investigating the refraction of a light by transparent block. She uses her results to determine a uh, quantity known as a refractive index. So you have to follow the instruction for these questions. Student places a transparent block ABCD on a uh, ray trace sheet indicate in figure 3.1. She draws a line N and M. Draw a normal to a line AB at point N and the normal should start above AB and extend below, a, uh, extend, uh, below AB so that it crosses C and D and label the point at which the normal crosses CD as L. So what we have to do, we have to draw a normal. So we have to draw a normal here above AB. Normal means the line which is 90 degree or perpendicular to surface. And we have to continue this line until it crosses C and D. And the point or the position where this normal cross C and D, what we label, we label that as L. Then the next part, measure the angle theta between the normal and, and the line NM. So we have to label, uh, we have to measure the angle of incidence, which is theta here. We have to measure this angle. So using a protector, you will measure this angle. It should be about 40 degrees, 41, 42. Then the student places two pins P1 and P2 on the line NF at a suitable distance on a figure mark the appropriate position of the two pins. So we have to place two pins on this line M and N. So we have to place two pins here. The distance between the approximate distance between the two pins should be five centimeter like three to five centimeter is acceptable. So one is P1, another one is P2. So these are the two positions of the pin. Then student view the image of P1 and P2 through a block from a direction indicated by an eye. He places two pins P3 and P4, which are shown in the figure, and the image of P1 and P2 all appear or exit behind. Draw a line joining P3 and P4 and extend this line until it meet NL. So we have to draw a line which is joining P3 and P4. So this line will be there, which is joining P3 and P4. Uh, there is P4 also, I will zoom out. So this was a normal. So we drew the normal first above A, B and we continue until it meet. And you have to label, labeling the point is important. So this is point L, you measure this angle theta and you mark two positions of the pin P1 and P2. And you have to draw a line joining P3 and P4. So we draw a line joining P3 and P4 and they mention continue until it reaches or meet a point, uh, meet a line N and L. So this will be continue like this. And we have to label a point. So label a point at which the line crosses draw a line joining P3 and P4 and extend until it meets N and L. So with that we did. And label the point at which the line crosses CD as letter E and a point where it meets that is letter F. So this point where it crosses CD, we have to label this 
letter E and where it crosses normal or touches the normal, that is letter F. Then you have to measure a distance NE and EF or FE, NE and FE. So this whole figure, so we have to measure this distance NE, like we have to measure the distance between N and E. We don't have to draw a line. If you draw a line, it's okay. If you don't draw a line, that is also okay. So we have to measure a distance between this distance and FE. So this is A and this one is example B. So one is one length is known as A, another one is B and then A divided by B, you will get the value of refractive index. Then what are the precautions for this experiments? The experiment which involves the optical pins so what are the precautions you should take? You should use thin, thin lines, thin pins, look perpendicular, always view the base of the uh, pins. So these are, uh, or try to use a maximum spacing or maximum uh, distance between the two pins. So these are some precautions you should take for the optical pin experiment. Then another question, which is about a student is determining the focal length F. Figure 3.1 shows the apparatus, illuminated object is there. The student uh, places a screen at a distance of 70 centimeter, illuminated object and move. Different distances are there. 75, 80, 85, 90. And then this is U into V. Remember, you try to use the same number of significant figure when you're completing this column. The number of the significant figure, like some student use one column, three significant, next column, four significant. So it's not the right way. You should always use the same number of significant figure to complete the values. So the first one example, 1065. The second one, example 1,128. The third one, 1,200, 1,283, and 1,353. So four significant figures, all are having the same number of significant figures. Then the next part is plotting a graph. Again, there is a mistake in plotting a graph. Whenever you are plotting a graph, you should always use 70% of your graph paper. Some students selected the scale and their graph only completed in this part. So what happened the rest of the part? So this type of graph is not the correct. You have to use a 70% of your graph paper. So you should extend the scale. We don't have to write zero. As I mentioned, you do not need to start the axis from the origin. We have U into V and we have D. So what are the values of the D and what are the values of U? So U into V, it was starting from 1000, the value which was 1065 and ending around 1300. And D, uh, U into V is on Y axis. So we don't have to start the axis from origin. So example, the smallest value is 1065 and the highest is 1300. So if I select example 1000, then after 10 boxes, if I select 1100, then after another 10 boxes, 1200, then after another 10 boxes, 1300. I did not count the exact number like 10, just I'm, I'm explaining the idea that you should extend the scale. And what about the value of the D? The value of the D is, the smallest value is 70 and the highest is 90. And we don't have to start the graph from the origin. So we can select. So on X axis, we'll have D. On Y axis, we have U into V. So the number, we don't have to start the axis from origin. So we can start, for example, 1000. Then after 10 boxes, 1100. Then after another 10 boxes, 1,200, then 1,300. And same, 
for D, which is in uh, centimeter, and U into V, which is in centimeter square. So minimum value is 70 and the maximum is 90. So I can start with 70, then in between, after 20 boxes, example, 80, and then after another 20 boxes, 90. So when I plot a graph with these values, my scale is extended. So a graph will somewhat like this. And I will cover about or more than 70% of the graph paper. Then we have to find the gradient. The next part, the gradient is take any two points on your line and try to take like maximum spacing for an accurate answer. So if you take like five centimeter distance between the two points, the first point is known as on the y-axis is y1 and the first point on x-axis is x1. The first point, uh, the second point on y-axis is y2. And the second point on x-axis is x2. So we'll use the formula y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 to get the gradient. So according to the graph, your graph, you will use the values to find the gradient. The gradient is about the range is there, for example, 15, 14. So you say the gradient is 15. Then the focal length is numerically equal to gradient, means they say the gradient and focal length are same. So if your gradient is 15, what should be the focal length? The focal length should also be 15. And normally the lenses which we are using in the lab, they have the focal length ranges from 4, 13 to 16, normally. And what is the unit of the focal length? The unit of the focal length is centimeter. Because unit of length, where normally the length is in centimeter, that's why the focal length is centimeter. Then two difficulties when we do in this experiment related to forming an image by a convex lens, we perform this experiment in a dark room. So for experimental accuracy, it should be performed in a completely dark room. We should measure the distance from the center of a lens. So it's take two difficulties when trying to obtain an accurate value. Image might be too blurred for this type of experiment. Image might not be clear or a blur. Maybe a parallax error measuring the length. So these are some sources of the errors or the difficulties which we may face when we are performing this experiment.